Welcome to WCAT TV and radio. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And I have with me today Father Philip Brown. Um, I'm very excited. Father Brown has written an article that just uh, came out this spring. Let's see if I can put this up here in Seminary Journal, uh, spring 2023. Um, wonderful article um, about teaching canon law in the seminary. Um, this article is just a breath of fresh air and, and very exciting to read. So, I'm Father Philip, I'm very happy to have you here with me today. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Kiki. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss my article and other matters with you. Amen. So, how about you start us off with a prayer, and then we'll I will do that. Uh, I'm a member of the Society of Saint Sulpice. The uh, Sulpicians uh, are. Real charism is seminary formation. And so I'd like to use the uh, prayer of Father Jean-Jacques Ollier, who is the founder of our society, to begin our uh, conversation today. O oh, Jesus, living in Mary, come and live in your servants. In the spirit of your holiness, in the fullness of your power, in the perfection of your ways, in the truth of your virtues, in the communion of your mysteries. Overcome every oppressing force in your spirit for the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, Father Philip, you are the President Rector of St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Maryland. Correct. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a priest of the Society of San Sulpice, which was founded in 1640, 1641 by Father Jean-Jacques Ollier, uh, specifically to support the seminary ministry of the church, which was very undeveloped. Seminaries are really a product of the Council of Trent. So his movement was one of the really first ones to begin developing uh, seminaries. So we've been uh, uh, training and forming priest for the service of the church for uh, since 1641. Wow. Uh, in the United States, uh, St. Mary's Seminary and University was established in 1791 by uh, Bishop John Carroll at the time when he invited Sulpicians to come from France to begin the work of forming priests for the church in the United States in domestic seminaries. So really seminary formation in the United States begins here at St. Mary's Seminary and University in 1791. And it might occur to you that the priests of the society in 1791 were looking for somewhere to go because of something that was going on in France at the time, and they were in great peril. So the needs of the church in America and the needs of the Sulpicians came together. Uh, I joined the society uh, roughly in 2004 when I came to do seminary formation and teach at St. Mary's Seminary and University. Uh, prior to that time, I was a pastor, uh, most immediately in the town of Dickinson, North Dakota. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, although, uh, since I joined the society, I'm really a priest of the Society of San Sulpice but still affiliated with the Diocese of Bismarck, uh, where I was a pastor for uh, quite a number of years. I also studied canon law during that time uh, uh, at the Gregorian University in Rome. And uh, prior to going to the seminary, I was a civil attorney. So that figures into my background and some of the work that I have done. Uh, and before I went to law school, actually, I studied music at the University of Michigan. In Ann Arbor. So I have a kind of a diverse background uh, with a lot of uh, interest, but I, it's amazing to me how all of it has come together in the work that I'm doing today as a seminary rector and president of uh, St. Mary's Seminary and University. So that tells a little bit about myself. Are you from the North Dakota area originally? Yes, I was born and I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota. I haven't been there, but I've been up. Montana. I think that's about as far north as I've gotten so far. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of Cardinal Avery Dulles. Yes. Uh, he was one of my professors. And when I introduced myself 
and said I was from uh, North Dakota, he said, that's one of those big square states, isn't it, out there in the middle of the country? I said, yeah, it is. It's and big cold. and it's square. And it's and cold. It's cold. <laughs> It's cold. Uh, so, um, so now you're teaching canon law, um, which I think yeah. is very exciting. It's always been one of my interests. Um, oh. So I'm, I'm excited for this. So you start off with the statement, a little learning is a dangerous thing. <laughs> Why is <I> do. that? <laughs> Well, first of all, because uh, I also am very, uh, I love poetry very much. And Alexander Pope is one of my very favorite poets for a number of reasons, both because his, his, of his poetry, but also because of his life story. He was a recusant Catholic uh, in the um, uh, 17th and 18th century in England. So he has a very interesting story in his faith life. Uh, but I took that quote uh, from his essay on criticism, uh, because I found that to be true throughout my academic career in my life. And I think it's a, it's a particular point in teaching canon law because um, many uh, seminarians, uh, even priests, are sort of enamored with the authority that being ordained a priest cloaks them with. And that can create a grave danger. Uh, to rely more on authority than reason and pastoral charity in carrying out their uh, function in the church. So I try to uh, really emphasize that from the beginning, that uh, canon law exists for the sake of the pastoral care of, of people, and uh, that uh, this is not the day of uneducated peasants who will follow wherever you lead, but uh, Catholics, especially in the United States, tend to be very well educated today. And so it's a mistake to think that you can just rely upon the authority of your office, you know, to keep people together and have them follow you. You also have to be willing to engage in discourse with them. And to do that, you have to be well educated. And so I've seen too many instances where people gain a little knowledge uh, and they like to throw that around in order to project authority. But if there's nothing deeper than that beneath it, they're not really going to be able to maintain the relationships for very long. So I try from the very beginning to point that out. Don't think because you take a course in canon law in the seminary that you really understand canon law and how to use it. A little knowledge is a dangerous yeah. thing. <laughs> you either go deeper or know the number of the chancery <laughs> And call the chancery when canonical questions the come up. I love that. Yes. So you you begin by discussing that you know we see this in many areas um, of seminary life um, that seminarians are coming into seminary in you know 2020, 2023 now um, you know in this century um, as a product of their culture um, and they come in with a lot of either erroneous ideas or confused ideas um, about all sorts of things, um, but often about matters of canon law. So you sort of have to start out sort of clearing the slate, cleaning the slate, as <laughs> they say, erasing the board before you start. Yeah, the uh, aspect that I emphasize in the article uh, is that seminarians come to the seminary and their canon law course with a lot of folk knowledge about canon law that uh, not infrequently is incorrect. And in reading the article, you may have seen, I chose a couple of examples to show where seminarians have completely the wrong idea uh, about actually what the norm of canon law is, much less the way that it should be applied. And so there is a process at the beginning of trying to disabuse them of the confidence they have in canon law uh, to sort of knock that down and say, wait a minute, there's much more to canon law than you think. And canon law is not just a set of rules for you to enforce, uh, but rather it really embodies the culture of Catholicism and is more importantly an educator than a source of enforcing you know, uh, rules 
and the life and the responsibility of, of Catholics. So I have a little phrase I like to use with the seminarians in canon law class, and that is, you know, please remember when you leave here that you are ordained to be a pastor, not a policeman. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, priest job is. Yep. I was saying, I think some of the problems that you run into with the seminarians as sort of products of the culture, we also, I mean, we lead prayer groups in the parish and we have a prayer group here, um, sort of a prayer and study group of scripture and tradition. Um, but we run into those same issues studying scripture and tradition um, that, you know, many people in the church uh, there was there was a comment made once at a meeting some years ago at our parish. Um, er, basically, the person said everything I needed to know about Catholicism I learned in CCD, and <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, good Lord, help us! And um, and so that a lot of people feel that that is the that that extent of their Catholic education is enough, and then based on that. They have these presuppositions about things, including canon law, but also, you know, moral law, um, Catholic moral law, um, that are very confused. Um, and they're these little bits of knowledge. You know, they've got half the picture, you know, like you got the picture of the elephant and you're blind. You're like, well, you got the trunk and you think it's a snake, you know. Um, so you get these little bits of knowledge. And then based on that, um, people are kind of like lemmings running off a cliff with that little bit of knowledge. Um, and of course we see this, sadly, we see it constantly on social media as well. Um, these confusions um, where someone has a little bit of knowledge. Um, yeah, seminarians come to the seminary. You know, I really, most of them, I have to say are deeply convicted and they want to advance the faith. Many of them have sort of what we would call a culture warrior mentality. You know, that it's us against the culture. Uh, and they maybe have some priest friends or others who have supported them, who have given them some folk knowledge and some attitudes. Uh, and I sometimes say as the rector of the seminary, you know, we have a hard time knowing what to teach you when you get here, since you already know everything before you enroll in the seminary. <laughs> I kind of you know, <laughs> poke them a little bit on that um in a good natured way but that that's just a feature of being young in every generation you know you have your worldview and you think that the world conforms to the way you see it and so in the process of education um you know i'm curious as a, as an educator yourself and a philosopher and theologian you know uh of uh, your reaction to my observation, because I always say, well, what's the biggest hurdle that I have in teaching canon law, or for that matter, theology, or anything in today's culture? And what I boil it down to is the extent to which, uh, in terms of canon law or philosophy, the extent to which philosophical and legal positivism have seeped into the consciousness of people to the extent that they don't even know it. Uh, and so they even interpret religious concepts and canon law in a positivistic way and don't understand the difference between the basic pillars are positivism on the one side uh, and natural law on the other. And canon law and the sort of cultural anthropology of the church is very much grounded in natural law thinking. Mm -hmm. And so even when I try to get across to the seminarians what that is and why it's so different, they're hearing it and interpreting what I say through a positivistic lens. So right. it's really hard to get over that hurdle uh, and find a way to do that. And in canon law, uh, the vehicle I try to use to try to get that across is, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas's definition of law, um, which is um, uh, lex est ratio ordinatio abeo qui curam curitate habet uh, per uh, ad bonum communem promulgata. In other words, law is an ordering according to reason by the one who has care of the community, for the good of the community, promulgated. 
Well, the key term for our purposes there is according to reason. And I try to get across to the seminarians. You see, you've been formed through your education to uh, uh, rely on reasoning. But reasoning is different than reason. <laughs> so Thomas Aquinas talks about right reason. That's a very hard thing for them, first of all, to get and then to accept because they've been so imbued with the, the subjective relativistic point of view that's now seeped into the general culture. And so to say, no, there's a right way of thinking. It's not just, I think this way, but you think that way. Uh, but really the tradition of the church and canon law says, no, but we're reasoning together to come to the right answer because there is a right answer that is correct. And I find it interesting that as recently as John Kennedy and Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, American presidents were talking about the importance of natural law and that we judge our actions you know, by the dictates of the natural law. When American jurisprudence, especially you know, through uh, very influential jurists like Oliver Wendell Holmes and Learned Hand, had jettisoned natural law from American jurisprudence long before either of them came along. So the general thinking and sense of people in America still was grounded to a fair extent in natural law, which really, when you understand it, is, is real reason, real reasoning. Whereas our legal system had completely gone over to a positivistic approach to law. And that, uh, I think, explains a lot of the absurdities that people sense in our legal system today, but don't really understand. Well, the same thing applies because our students come from that culture. And so they're just hardwired to think in that way. And to really, even though they want to say they're not relativists or subjectivists, their whole thinking process has been formed that way. So I have to try to, you know, lead them to some insight as to why that is and what it means for understanding canon law. Well, that concept that you bring out quite a bit between the pastoral care and policing, you know, the goods of the community and the individual um, that are grounded in natural law um, versus sort of policing things is... Um, it's fascinating. I mean, we do think of law, we think of policing things. Right. Um, right. Rules and regulations, you know. <laughs> man with what is it? The Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around, you know? Yes. <laughs> and not uh, man for the Sabbath. So we we you know, we certainly are a country that does think in those terms, a culture that thinks in those terms. Yeah, and that's a very we see we see this on social media all the time. Um in and out, you know, you talk about the two, you know, the, the folk knowledge, you know, you can fall into legalism and you can fall into that suggestions <laughs> categories. Um, and of course, we see both of these extremely on social media. Um, you know, people that want no law whatsoever or people that want everyone hit over the head with the book of law. Um, and there's and neither has reason. You know, reason is is out the window for both both of those camps. I think that is a really a really key factor uh, today, both in the church and socially, um, to understand. I ask a question of the students. I've only had a student get a, uh, this. I've never had a student get this question right. And that is that, um, well, according to Thomas Aquinas's definition, if a law is not reasonable, well, then it's not a law at all. It has to be reasonable to be a law. But of course, positivism says you can't even ask that question. If the law has been created by somebody with authority, that's the law, you must follow it, you can't question it. Whereas the natural law tradition says, no, you can always question the validity of a law based upon whether or not it is reasonable. So the question I ask the students that no one has ever gotten right is, so who can tell us if a law is reasonable. And generally the answers that I get are Jesus, you know, God, the president. I say, no, 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 the Supreme Court, no. 
who can tell us what a reasonable law is? And when I finally tell them, they think I'm making a joke. I say, a reasonable person. And so in order to, and what the genius of that in Thomas Aquinas' approach that I try to tell them is that you see, there is no final word on what is reasonable, but rather by saying that's an element of the law, I mean, we must always be examining the law and every law for its reasonableness. And every law is open to question because it can be more reasonable, but it keeps us moving forward in the dialogue about what is reasonable. Whereas I feel today, I wrote a comment about this to an article the other day, uh, that the I think the crisis in America and in education today is that our students graduating from college are taught to emote. They're not taught to reason. They're taught to take a position and defend it to the death and destroy anyone who disagrees with it. Whereas to engage in a process, a discourse, civil discourse of reasoning towards the truth. Um, well, of course, if you live in a subjectivistic, relativistic culture, then people don't ask questions about truth anymore. They say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. It's a big leap today to get people to acknowledge well, no, but there is the truth. There is what is true and what is not. Let's together examine it and discuss, you know, does this really ring true? Can we show that it's true over time, if that makes sense? And I think social media, the way it is set up, for at least for most people, um, it's set up such that we surround ourselves with people who think like we do or who don't think like we don't think. Um and and so there can be no there can be no dialogue there can be no dis, you know reasonable discussions um, if a discussion starts and people disagree um, then they're defriended and shut off and and the conversation ends or they just start name calling and screaming <laughs> um, and and so we surround ourselves by like I said by people who think like we do or don't think like we don't think and and so there's no ability to engage in reason in this culture yeah i don't uh you know i don't use social media myself um i i see a place for uh virtual learning i see a place for zoom meetings but i don't like to rely on them too much i don't like them and it's for the same reason that i'm very cautious about the social media and that is I don't have to be accountable for what I say on social media, number one. And number two, I put a screen between me and the other person. So I don't have to feel the impact of my words on that other person. They're just my words. But really, real discourse, that's why I, I let want to have students in the room, not teaching them over the uh, internet. Because part of the dialogue is sensing and feeling the interaction and the reactions of other people to what is being said. And not just, so, you know, the virtual, the uh, digital media are good for information. We say we're in the information age, but that's the problem. They're only good for conveying information. They're not really good for discourse um, and uh, that kind of reasoning together. The, you can do reasoning together, but it's much better for those reasons, I think. Yeah, for some reason, people on social media, um, even very well-meaning people that I've known, um, they tend to lean towards being very harsh and unkind in their discussions in ways that they would never be in person. Um, and, and an example was I had two two delightful friends. I, I know them both very well, just two charming gentlemen, um, both reasonable gentlemen and, and kind and compassionate. And, and they got into a discussion, a back and forth on social media, um, like two little monsters. <laughs> and I had to sort of step in and say, hey, look, I know both. And, and they were doing it on one of my social media pages. And I had to step in privately to both of them and say, whoa, like you, you're a gentleman. You're a Catholic gentleman, both of you. Um, what's going on here? Like, if, if you're going to discuss anything on my page, I expect you to do it, you know, compassionately and kindly um, and not 
in this manner. And they both apologized and went on to have a civil discussion. Um, it was interesting to me that, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it is related to what I was saying a moment ago. And that is, you know, when you're on social media, you can say anything and the other person can't punch you in the nose. <laughs> they can stop talking to you. And that's right. about it. But they can't that's punch you in the nose. Yeah. And about 10 years ago, more than that, when I was at Catholic University, uh, I was trying to promote a colloquium uh, to bring uh, representatives, essentially, of both political parties together uh, for a colloquium to discuss how how, how can we begin to learn how to speak civilly to one another and have real discourse? And I approached a friend of mine uh, and a former classmate who was in Congress at the time and asked, "Would you? what do you think of this idea? Would you be willing to promote it? And he said, I think it's a great idea. But he said, I don't think it'll go anywhere because he said, in Congress, we go into our caucus, we're told what to say and what not to say. And if we don't just tout the party line, we know we won't get any legislation moved forward. So he said, I think that's a big source of it. But he said, when I first went to Congress, you know, we had relationships and friendships with people with very divergent views. Now he said, you get on the elevator with somebody from the other party, they won't even talk to you. They just look past you. That's a serious, serious place to be, a bad place to be for our culture. Right. But unfortunately, I think I see that in the social media and, and journalism in the in the church as well. People lob, you know, Molotov cocktails at one another, metaphorically. Uh, but where's the real dialogue? Right. I was amazed in 2010, I attended a conference in, at Princeton University that was put together um, by Charlie Camosi and Dr. Peter Singer and Francis Kissling. It was called the Life and Choice Conference. And it was two full days um, where 200 pro-life people and 200 pro-choice slash pro-abortion people came together in the same room for 48 hours for talks and discussion and dialogue. Um, and it was intense. It was really intense. Some people couldn't handle the intensity and left after the first day. Um, but my husband and I hung in there. And it was amazing to me. I mean, there was dialogue, there was discussion, it was civil. Um, it was reasonable. People thought about what was being said on both sides. Um, I don't think there'll ever be another one because um, pro-life sort of came out on top. And I think that was kind of surprising <laughs> to the people at Princeton. They weren't expecting um, the the reasonable, the reasoning and the reason of the pro-life side to be as strong as it was. I think everyone was quite shocked. I thought we were going to be decimated because it was at Princeton. Um, so it was it was amazing. But it it is possible, you know, people, 400 people were there and and we we did it. And nobody nobody got punched in the nose, you know, um, but it was I've, difficult. What I've observed, I've been... I was very involved in pro-life uh, as a college student, a young person, and I've had very strong convictions and involvement, you know, throughout my whole life. But back then, at that time, you know, I was concerned because I said, I think that the worst enemy of the pro-life movement is going to end up to be a lot of pro-life people, you know, because they can't engage in a dialogue. True from the other side, I saw this polarization. But going back to St. Thomas, who doesn't have the answer for everything, I read other people too. But one thing I know that uh, that he says, I think in the Summa, I'm not sure, but he says, you know, you have there has to be some common ground for uh, discussion, for discourse. If there's no common ground, you can't really have discourse. Well, what I, I've seen over my lifetime is that, and I've always considered it kind of a rhetorical strategy is simply to deny the common ground, to not concede any common ground, so there can't be any argument. So there was a very famous incident, I thought it was interesting, a debate on the floor of the Congress uh, between, I think it was Chris Smith and, um, 
Oh, I can't think of her name now. She was from California, a congresswoman. She passed away, Barbara Boxer. And he was very, very effective in making these pro -ar you know, pro-life arguments. But I listened and, and she, she never conceded a point, but she never really made a point. Her arguments were all just simply denying that there's any basis for us to not just make this decision or discuss it. So I think that's that's a challenging thing that has to be overcome, you know. Mm. And I, I often start an argument with the common ground. That, that's yeah. sort of the goal of thumb. And it was interesting at that at that meeting, and I, I talked to this one. I, I am a pro life speaker as well now. Um, one of the things I talk about that that came out of that conference for me that I, I spread the word is that there is a lot of common ground. Um, and what we found was, except for two or three people at that conference, we found that the pro-choice side was pro-life up to 20 weeks. I mean, it was pro-choice up to 20 weeks, but from 20 to 40 weeks, they were all pro-life, except for a handful, a small handful of people. All the pro-choice people were pro-life after 20 weeks. So I tell people, you know, that's halfway through pregnancy. So you have 20 weeks of common ground to start right. with. You know, so start with your common ground. So with any reasonable argument, I always start with common ground. You know, even if somebody's like way off base in their conclusion, I'll say, well, we agree where you started from, you know, um, and go from well, there. I felt, uh, even back then, this would have been in, I mean, I was involved in 1972 before, you know, uh, Roe versus Wade uh, on a very liberal college campus at the University of Michigan. But what led me to feel that the uh, many in the pro-life movement were going to really uh, be uh, setting up impediments uh, was feeling so passionately about um, the that this involves taking a human life and the defense of human life that they were really sort of tone deaf to what the arguments on the other side that were talking about the real life circumstances of women that uh, they're resorting to this for. And so I said, until pro-lifers are willing to open, acknowledge the legitimacy of that concern and say, well, look, yeah, how do we also address that problem? Then we're not gonna be able to make any, any progress. Um, and of course, from the pro, choice standpoint, it was simply the effectiveness, I have to say this, I don't mean it in entirely a pejorative way, but the success that the pro-choice movement has had in dehumanizing the human person before birth. So that, you know, well, why do you worry about this, you know, let's say, say glob of cells? So there's a big gap there. How do you get to that common ground to say, well, no, this is really human, human being who we have to give some uh have some concern for and it's it's a an intractable many conflicting realities involved but how do we come to a good policy that is avoiding as much tragedy as possible rather than making tragic i mean a million and a half abortions a year is tragic that's a tragedy you know a woman dying because of self-induced abortion is a tragedy Okay, how do we try to, there's going to be some tragedy in life. How do we minimize it? I think it begins with acknowledging the humanity of the person you're arguing with, <laughs> which sometimes, about you that? know, pro-life is a novel idea. <laughs> so, oh, goodness. So let's get back to your article, which is, is just wonderful. So one of the things... Um, you talk about is, you know, you have this church hierarchy, um, but that it's all in service to the people of God. Um, and so sometimes seminarians get caught up in the concept, like you mentioned, of the hierarchy, you know, that they're, they're going to be placed in this authority and the kind of lose sight of, you know, that through baptism, we're all equal in the church. Um, and so you want to start with that roots up sort of of mentality in, in the seminary of, of that recognition of your priest in service to the people of God, um, that, that, that beautiful ontological equality that we begin with. 
um, there's a, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the bishop, but there was a well-known bishop back in the day, I think in Europe, who um, said something to the effect of, you know, it's very important that we all know that we're all equal, from me all the way down to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> well, that's why when I, there's, you know, different approaches to teaching general, the general canon law course. But I always started with the people of God and uh, book two and with the people of God and the fundamental equality of all Christians um, through baptism. And then canonical rights and responsibilities emerge from that. But it really is grounded in this uh, fundamental equality. I have another little metaphor I use you, you might uh, like or not. Um, I call it the, the, and I actually developed it when I was practicing civil law, not, but it's true on the church. And I call it the county sheriff syndrome. In the United States, generally, anybody can be elected county sheriff. A 7-Eleven clerk can be elected county sheriff. Once he's elected and puts on a badge, he's the greatest authority on law enforcement and criminology in the world, as far as he's concerned. Or a judge when he puts a robe on, a robe on, or a priest when he puts on a Roman collar. That's what is attractive to some guys who come into the seminary for whatever reason, uh, and that is this gives me authority and power. Uh, it's a very seductive kind of thing, but I think that's where we have to open up that discussion and say, well, no. Yes, there is real authority in the priesthood, but it's given to you for the good of the people you serve. It's given for service, not to exalt yourself uh, above other people. And we're uh, trying to um, develop a new concept here at the seminary somewhat. Uh, we got a very actually generous grant from the Lilly Foundation to create a, an institute for pastoral studies and pastoral formation. What we want to start talking with the seminarians about more is the pastoring parish, not the pastor. In other words, that everyone in the parish has a role in providing pastoral care for the people of God. The pastor has a particular role, but his role is also to, I call it, to be an animating spirit in the parish and a consoling spirit, to animate the gifts of others to go forth and carry out the pastoral ministry of the church in their proper role, in particular, so he can be available to go and do the particular work of a priest. And that is to console people to perform the sacraments. But there's so many other things that everyone can participate in. And I think that's the way we're going to distribute the sense of what the real um, place of everyone is. And that the ordained ministries. Do not put you above others. That idea is that sensibility is still there with a lot of people. I think uh, it's 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 not good. You know? That's a that's an excellent concept of a pastoring parish. I love that. Um, I mean, clericalism obviously is is rampant in the priesthood, but it's also rampant throughout. Like you're saying, throughout the laity, is you know everything begins and ends with father and. Um, I mean, I have, I do the decorating at the church and I, I've encountered, you know, if I say to somebody, could you light that candle or could you move that plant? Their response will be, well, we have to ask father first, yeah. you know, and it's like, wow, I'm a convert to Catholicism, um, 1983, 1985. So it, to me, it's fascinating. I'm like, seriously? And they're like, you know, he's not just the pastor. It's like he's God himself you know, running around the parish. And it's like, no, you're you're the people of God, you know, we're 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 part of this picture and just move the plant, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so, I think so, that's clearly the the vision of the Second Vatican Council and where we're at right now and what Pope Francis is trying to get across, inculcate to people. There is real authority. Um and I know I've, you know, worked with priests who you start talking about what the bishop can do, and their first response is the bishop can do whatever he wants. Well, the bishop may have a lot of authority to do whatever he wants, 
But is that a good thing to do just whatever you want, disregard uh, the wants and the needs and the impact on other people? And so there is an authority that should be held in reserve if it's really needed, but that's not the first step. The first step is to diffuse healthy functioning of the body of Christ, which includes everyone. Yeah. That really comes out in your article, this this I this understanding that um the people of God, the faithful, have a right to the goods of the church, um, the sacraments, um, the communal goods of the church, um, and that the the, the priest um, and all of us are there to help one another receive those goods um, rather than sort of police who should and shouldn't get them. And, you know, you discuss a lot of, of the, um, you know, this, the, you don't want the communion rail being policed. And, oh my. Right. So that's a huge question that's come up certainly a lot on social media. I bump into that all the time, but in politics, um, the policing at the communion rail um, you know, the law, we got to, you know, again, there with the, you know, everybody should receive, you know, almost nobody should receive and the priests being there, you know, to sort of say no right at the communion rail publicly. Um, I know someone that that happened two years ago. They, they were at their really? sister's wedding and they went up for communion at their sister's wedding and the priest happened to know something personal about them and refused her communion right at the rail at the wedding and um, it was very damaging. It's very damaging. Um, thank goodness she didn't leave the church, um, but it was painful for years, um, the embarrassment and the hurt of not receiving the Eucharist at her sister's wedding. Um, yeah, I've seen it happen where they have, where people have left the church in my own family. And it's very, very painful. And uh, I think a, if, if not an abuse, a misunderstanding of the pastoral role, you know, uh, first of all, to use personal knowledge about someone in that way is really wrong. Uh, bad. And if there are bad consequences, the bad consequences are the bad consequences for the person, you know, not for the priest. He's not violating his priesthood. Um, and we always like to say, if you think that's a good policy, go to St. Peter's sometime and watch people going to communion. <laughs> you know, look at all the tourists who are, you know, probably atheists who go up and receive communion. And nobody's sitting there trying to, you know, figure it out. Part of the problem is you don't know enough about a person to know if they're really, um, you know, technically or canonically uh what uh qualified to be receiving a sacrament at the communion rail you don't know that right the only thing that would ever justify that in my mind and i tell seminarians that is you know if it's something that's going to cause true scandal you know if you have the episcopal priest in town come and who's spoken out against the catholic church is wrong come to mass and come up and present himself for communion well, that's a different story, you know. Right. That will cause scandal, right? Because it would cause this great scandal. And if you knew, the thing to do first is say, "Please don't do this. This isn't going to be good for people." So, if someone's sort of like defiantly trying to make a public statement, that's the only circumstance. Otherwise, it's too personal. Too, you just don't know enough. Yeah, I agree with you. You used a term I had never heard before: sacramental perfectionism. That was uh, interesting to me. I was like, ooh, I like that. You know, that's interesting um, concept that, you know, trying to judge at the communion rail who's perfect enough to receive the body of Christ. Um, well, none of us are. You know? Who is? <laughs> Just the argument in the car on the way to Mass disqualifies most of us. You know? Yeah. <laughs> with the kids screaming in the back seat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So you spend um, quite a bit of time in canon law discussing marriage. You have a marriage course. Um, and um, you start out with your seminarians sort of discussing misconceptions 
um, even the definition of marriage, the annulment process. Um, what kind of misconceptions do seminarians come in with? Or cultural? Well, I, <laughs> the biggest misconception is actually pretty technical, and I discuss it in the uh, article. Uh, and that is, and I, you know, we'll ask them this, and that is that, well, the church never, the church does not permit divorce ever. Well, divorce is a technical uh, term. And actually, the church does permit divorces in certain circumstances in terms of what a divorce is technically. Okay. Uh, and it's all, it's a very technical matter and it's a narrow set of circumstances. So the problem is confusing divorce with annulment. And then seminarians assuming an annulment is a divorce and therefore it can never be allowed. And that was very, very uh, prominent point of view for a long time in the church. And it was extremely difficult to get an annulment. Well, that's an example of where if your marriage is not valid, you have a right to have it declared null. That's a right that you have. You shouldn't be held to a marriage when you're not in a valid marriage. Um, but I, I use an expression to shock the students um, that I only, I don't mean it entirely facetiously, but it's to sort of wake up the seminarians. And that is that I say, well, you think the canon of law of marriage is about marriage. It's not really about marriage. It's about getting people out of marriages. <laughs> they say, what? Well, getting people into a valid, uh, loving, life-giving marriage is pastoral ministry. Canon law is there to just define the parameters of when someone has actually entered a sacramental marriage that is indissoluble, you know, that cannot be dissolved. And so there's a beautiful pastoral aspect to the church's canon law of marriage that escapes people, you know, unfortunately. And that is the church has a very low bar for people getting married. And that we don't ask too many questions. We ask the essential questions, but we try not to stand in the way of people marrying the person they want to marry, even if we think, boy, is this a mistake, you know? But that's in support of the human dignity of the members of the faithful and their right to make their own choices and marry who they want to marry. We know a lot of people get into marriages that don't work out. And then they come to the church and they say, well, it's no different than the civil society. Civil society will not allow you to just walk away from a marriage and go marry someone else. You have to go through a legal process first where the law grants you a divorce and allows you to leave this marriage and marry someone else in the terms of the law. Uh, so the annulment process is that, like that. It is, it is saying, well, look, you wanted to marry this person. And so we let you marry this person. You went through the motions and by everything you did, it looks like you entered a valid marriage. So the church presumes that's a valid marriage. If later it doesn't work out and you want to get out of it so you can marry someone else, well, the presumption is still there, then you have to prove that it was not valid. It's in a certain way, it's like the presumption of innocence. Everyone is presumed innocent if they're charged with a crime. They might be guilty, but they're presumed innocent until they're proven guilty. Well, it's the same thing in the church. If a marriage, if all the external factors were done correctly, um, then the church presumes that's a valid marriage. If you don't think it was valid and you want to get out of it, all right, then let's examine it and see if it really was. Then we put it under a microscope that we don't put people's desire to marry under. We say, all right, we're going to do a, we're going to do a, you know, forensic examination, a pathological dissection of this marriage. Was it really valid? Um, and you know, the easiest way to explain that uh, example is. Uh, marriage is based upon two people exchanging consent. If I go into the church and I say the words of consent in a marriage ceremony, 
the church presumes that's a valid marriage. However, consent is something that doesn't happen through my words essentially alone. It happens in my mind. If my mind, I say, I agree to be married and this is a permanent commitment. I say that out loud. But in my mind, I say, but if I'm not happy with it a year from now, I'm going to leave. You have not given valid consent because you have not really consented to what consent is. If you can prove that, then that's an invalid marriage. Now, there are, there are a, a valid sacramental marriage. There are natural marriages, which happen in civil society all over the world. We're concerned with, was there a sacramental bond formed? It might appear, we might presume that one was, but now we're going to look and see, was one really formed? I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine uh, recently who had gone through an annulment. And it was in a group setting. She said, well, I, she said, I don't, I don't think I really believe marriage is a sacrament. You know, you hear people say the church made marriage a sacrament in the 12th century or whatever. That's what actually not true. Uh, but she says, I don't really believe it's after what I went through in my first marriage. I don't really be, believe that marriage is a sacrament. My response to her was, I said, well, but that's what you're, that's what the church told you when it granted you an annulment. That your marriage was not a sacramental marriage. But that doesn't mean marriage isn't a sacrament if it's properly formed and lived out as a sacrament and is able to be a sacrament. The reasons why two people, their marriage could never be a sacrament because there's something lacking mentally in one of the parties when they give consent. So I would say that's uh, you know, how I would respond to those concerns about marriage. It's, it's delicate. It's delicate. But actually, I think the canon law of marriage is much more pastoral than people realize, as is the annulment process when it happens. Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, later Pope Benedict, had made the statement at one point, you know, he wondered whether there could be any valid marriages in the West because the society had degraded so much um, that people didn't have a clear understanding anymore of what marriage even was. Um, and obviously, this was even before we moved into the civil same-sex marriage. Um, so obviously, on a pastoral level, um, the annulment process is looking at the culture in which people are attempting to enter into marriage. Um, because, you know, a lot of people in the church are saying, well, why are there so many annulments? Um, and I always say, well, look at the culture. I, I go back to that statement of Joseph Ratzinger and say, I, I think he was on to something there. Um, well, I do think hard. many canonists would agree with that. And I had very fine canon law professors who, you know, raised that same question. It's a question. But as a canonist, for me, in the end, it depends on that person. What did that person understand? That's what the annulment process uh, delves into. Uh, I don't think you can assume that all marriages or many marriages are null until you actually look at them, but many probably are. And um, so are we doing enough job, a, a good enough job in catechizing people about marriage. We call it remote preparation. When I was a child, actually that was done much better. People entered adulthood really understanding how the church understood marriage. Today, I agree. I don't think we can take that for granted because they're not uh, being catechized and, and uh, educated about the teaching of the church to the extent that is necessary to have that real freedom of will to be able to say, no, I understand what I'm doing if I consent to marriage and I want to do it and I consent to do it. That's why there are so many annulment processes today because so many people, unfortunately, it's a mess. You know, relationships are a mess today. And we can, it's a whole other hour discussion about, in one way about why that is, another way it's not such a big discussion as you look at the cultural revolution of the 60s and the 70s, and it ex explains a lot. There was really a transformation of people's values and understanding that's taken place that leads to a lot of these challenges that we have today. 
I thought it was interesting that you said, you know, it's not the role of the priest to sort of look at this couple and say, well, do I think this will work out or not? They, they have a right to marry, a natural right, even grounded in natural law, but they have this have right to marry and to choose whom they wish to marry um, and that they're giving consent and that it's not the role of the priest or the parish um, to sort of say, well, I think that these two will make it, these two won't, because we, you mentioned priests and, of course, the community. We've all seen marriages that start out and we think, oh, these guys won't make it six months. And you know, 60 years later, they're still exactly. going strong. And then the couple, of course, we all know the couple that we think they're perfect for one another. And a year later, they're divorced and it's heartbreaking. And we think what happened. Um, and I, so I thought that was one of the most interesting things in the article, that it's it's not the priest's role or responsibility to try to figure this all out. You know, uh, no. that, if it doesn't work out, then canon law can come in later as pastorally as possible and try to dig through the mess. <laughs> I, I think I got the point across then, if that's what yeah. you took. Because that's yeah. really what I tell the students. That's what I was trying to say. And I think it's very caring. You know, what parent, you know, maybe there are some, but what parent has a 16-year-old who's about to make a very poor decision, who says, but I can't force my decision upon you. You have to make your, but you're going to have to then deal with the consequences. That's how we bring people up. Or when you're dealing with 23-year-olds or 30-year-olds, we can't be trying to make the right decision for other people. We have to give them their freedom, but then have the pastoral care to say, we know people make mistakes, and we're not just going to leave you out there without the care of the church and the ability to get your life you know, put back together. I have my, one of my questions that I want to ask you, because I know our listeners will, some of them will be asking this question. So we had this pastoral care of people who've entered into something that's, that at the time of the marriage, there were underlying factors that made it a mess um, that are going to come out later, whether it's problems with consent or drug addiction, alcohol addiction that people don't know about, things that um, limit the ability to consent in the first place. And now, you know, we're down the line a year or two or more. It's it's a, an unhappy, miserable situation. Um, they're seeking an annulment. And then there's a person who's going to step in and say, well, you took a vow for better or for worse, and you got worse. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, we're sorry you got worse, and I got better, but um, you got worse. Um what would you say to people who think, well, you're just annulling the worst ones and keeping the good ones? Say again, though? You're just annulling the worst. <laughs> you know, so you take a vow, I will, you know, stay with you for better or for worse. Um, and then when worse comes along, you get an annulment. I think there's a lot of people that think that's what the annulment process is. That when the marriage turns worse, they get an annulment, and that that right. vow doesn't matter. Right. That's a little bit uh, tricky uh, to answer. The vow does matter. Um, the real question is, in one sense, the starting point is, well, why did it get worse, you know? Was it destined to get worse because there was something from the very beginning that was not did not uh, capacitate the marriage to really take and blossom into a permanent sacramental union? Uh, the canon law is asking a kind of a different question. I know that's what it looks like to people on the outside. I know that's how some marriage tribunals have functioned in certain periods, you know, uh, where I've heard certain marriage from the past, but marriage tribunal personnel say, give me the marriage, I'll find a way to annul it. Well, that's not an honest approach, you know, to what the annulment process is really about. Uh, so that's just, uh, uh, this is something um, I have to say, 
in this crisis, uh, Cardinal Burke commented on this. He's a controversial figure for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I really have agreed with him on this statement. He said, the problem with the marriage tribunals, you know, is not that they're just that they're not doing a good enough job. The solution is to train canonists better. We don't look at the real source of the problem. Canonists aren't looking deep enough and seriously enough into those reasons, you know, why marriage did not uh, continue. The hardest cases, so that's a matter of just reality. You know, do you have uh, a sufficient process, an honest process? Um, Skillebex has a very good bit on marriage. He's another controversial theologian. Uh, and the areas where he's theological, I don't know so much about, but he wrote one of the best things I've seen uh, on marriage. And he talks in his book that I use in my course about the tragic nature of marriage. Well, it's sort of like the tragic nature of the relationship between God and humanity. And that is, you can get into a marriage that is very difficult. That in fact is, you made a true commitment. But now you have to live out the suffering of dealing with someone, you know, who is hard or a relationship that's hard to make work. That doesn't mean that it's not a, a, a good marriage in that sense, or it might not be a good marriage because it can't, it wasn't good from the beginning. But I know many couples, you know, where I really admire people who have stuck with a very difficult spouse and helped them through some real difficult personality problems. And the marriage is enriched because of it. So that's sort of like where you're called to sacrifice and you know, the tragedy of marriage. The more difficult cases that people rise is that the annulment of a marriage is a legal process that requires and depends upon explicit evidence, you know, proving the case and not. The real tragic situations for annulment is when the marriage very well may be null, but you just don't have the evidence to prove it, you know, and then because of the presumption the church is saying, well, we can't annul this marriage. That's what Pope Francis tried to address. He caused quite a stir, you know, with um, Amoris Laetitia, and I think it was footnote 32 or whatever it was, where he was suggesting there might be a way to recognize the nullity of marriages without going through the annulment process. And I know as a canonist, I kind of recognized that uh, and reacted to it at first. I thought, oh, I don't, I mean, but the problem is for the good of marriage, we can't just let people decide, you know, um, because they don't want to be in a marriage, which is what that kind of opens the door to. But when I studied the question and what he said, and I did some more research on it, I was quite impressed with the depth of his understanding of the theology of marriage and the annulment process, because it goes way back into about the 17th century. Uh, and that is... Going back to this question, what causes a marriage to come into existence? Consent. Well, there may be elements of consent that only are present in the person's mind that you can't prove in the external forum. If someone got married but his mind said, but I'm not going to have children, or we're going to have two children, but if she gets pregnant a third time, I'm going to really, I'm going to, Either she has to get an abortion or we're going to separate. Well, that's not a valid marriage. But only he knows that he believed that at the time. And so it's very difficult to prove that if there's no external evidence at the time that he said to somebody, I wasn't really in favor of you know, being open to children. Um, what Pope Francis, because it actually, in reality, that's an invalid marriage. The crisis is you, you can't prove it in the external forum, maybe. Mm -hmm. What Pope Francis was trying to say is there should be room at a certain level where you can discern someone's heart and conscience at the time they entered a marriage, and it becomes evident to a minister of the church that there really was not valid consent there canonically and allow them to move on. Well, that remains very controversial, but I'm much more sympathetic to what he was trying to say than many canonists who rely, you know, 
on the necessity of the external process. Does that make sense? I know it gets kind of technical. It does to me. I think it's very exciting. Um, I mean, I think we are moving into a deeper understanding of mercy and compassion and that we have to, especially in such a difficult society um, where we do have the breakdown of the family in general affecting people's lives. Um, I, I think it's, I, I, I loved Morris Letizia. I think it, it opened the possibility of this deeper, to, you know, organic development of mercy and compassion. Um, I mean, I, I, I know of a situation just, you know, um, where I see how important it is. There's, there's um, a young woman, she's, um, she's divorced, she's civilly divorced. She began the annulment process, but never completed it. Um, she has three children and now she's, she's engaged, um, to another man and, um, they both go to church. They both receive the Eucharist. Uh, they're, they're sort of living together, but they are, but th there's been three children involved <laughs> and they have, um, she has over the years, um, brought the children to mass every week when she can. Uh, they have all received their sacraments. They have stayed, you know, they've received their first Eucharist and first confession and, and confirmation. So the children have remained in the church because she has remained in the church. And she has remained in the church because she was never embarrassed at the communion rail. She's not the kind of person who would have continued to go to church if she was denied the Eucharist. Um, that's just pretty obvious to me at least um so the whole family and and this new partner they're all have remained in the church and primarily the children are in the church and being brought up as catholics um because of this compassion and mercy um they weren't lost in the system <laughs> you know they didn't you know leave the church or leave become unchurched altogether and and that was a possibility without the compassion and mercy of the pastors involved and the church. Um, and, and so when I saw Amoris Letizia saying, you know, you know, that may be a good choice, you know, that may be a pastoral way. I, I see the necessity of that because I see these three children who would have been unchurched otherwise. Um, and instead we have, you know, they're, they're good Catholic young men today because one may even be headed for the priesthood one of these days um, because that compassion and mercy was there um, and that nobody was, nobody, the, the pastor didn't act as policeman. Everyone who takes a canon law course or reads canon law likes to cite canon 7, 5, 1752. Often it's miscited, but that's okay. Uh, which is the canon that says this, the, the salvation of souls is the supreme law of the church. And canonical equity must always be applied. And that's really tipping the canon law's hat to compassion and mercy and saying the law should always serve the ends of compassion and mercy. It should be interpreted and implied in a way that is going to result in doing the compassionate thing and the merciful thing. Well, you know, you get others who feel it's out of a sense of responsibility. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, be critical in that sense, but say, well, no, but we have to, we have to have rules and we have to, you know, live by the rules. And if we allow these things to go on, we're just looking like hypocrites, you know. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Oscar Wilde. Uh, I believe it was Oscar Wilde um, who said, well, you know, hypocrisy is the ransom that virtue pays to vice. <laughs> and what he was Did really say saying is hypocrisy is the ransom that virtue pays to vice. <laughs> and what he was saying is you can't maintain any type of virtuous life without at least a little hypocrisy because we're all human. And we all are lacking in some respect. And so I always thought it was a little bit of a mistake. There was a big project 
back in the 70s, the 80s, where moral theologians were trying to create a new template for moral theology to create principles of moral theology based upon pastoral practice and pastoral theology. And as I looked at that, I said, I think that's kind of a mistake um, uh, because moral theology exists to tell us what the parameters are. Pastoral theology is there to deal with the messiness of life, that none of us are capable of living our life completely within the rails. Maybe a few, of course, there are saints. Um, so actually, I think maintaining that sort of dual approach to people, sort of like what we do with marriage. You can marry whoever you want. We're not going to ask too many questions. You go ahead and marry. But when it falls apart, we're there to catch you and to look at it and say, were you really capable? Was that really a bad decision that didn't form a good marriage? Now we're going to we're going to open it up so that you can move on with your life and deal with the messiness of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it's beautiful. I tell seminarians, you know, if you can't deal with blood, don't become a surgeon. If you can't deal with injustice, don't become a lawyer. If you can't deal with sin, don't, for God's sake, don't become a priest. Because we <laughs> like sin, that. and life is messy because we sin. As a priest, you're there to keep people moving in the right direction. I, I have one other example. I don't want to prolong it. But it's the crisis of the couple who are living together before marriage. Well, now it's everybody. You know, when I started out as a priest, it was still not everybody. And the, so you have the priests who want couples to move apart until they get married and makes a big issue. Now you get them mad. They're only there because their parents want them to get married in the church. Now the parents are mad because you're... And what I tell them is, now step back from this for a minute. Why do you feel you have to do that, number one? They're moving in the right direction. Why do you want to deter them from moving in the right direction? They're going to bring this together as you know a real marriage. And I and I also say I don't I don't advocate or justify living together you know, or sexual activity out of marriage. Now, however, you know it happens, right? <laughs> and if this is like some phenomenon of the twentieth century that is so horrible. Why has the church always recognized common law marriage? Which means people live long together long enough that their relationship becomes a marriage. Or they have actually made that commitment to one another without going through a formal ceremony. That, For most of the history of the church, that created a marriage. They didn't have to have a marriage ceremony. So that's where I think pastoral care comes in. You just you, you have to deal with the culture that's in front of you. You can't restore the culture of 1950. Right. You know, you have to live with this culture and learn how to be that kind of compassionate, merciful pastor, church, parish that really is what the church is all about. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I went through a very messy time in my own life years ago, and, and I, I really credit it to a number of pastors, a number of priests in my life who were who were compassionate and merciful and you know dragged me through it <laughs> by the scruff of my neck um with their compassion and mercy um and and so i you know i, I stayed catholic and got through it and wound up you know <laughs> at holy apostles college and seminary eventually you know okay. getting my degree and teaching homiletics and um, but I could have been lost in that time period beforehand if it wasn't for that compassion and mercy. So I, I well, that's it. If I had a motto, it would be you no. Know, I can't pull it right out, but it's don't. And I can't remember where it comes from, but you know, don't break the bruised reed or quench the, you know, the embers of the fire. That's my pastoral attitude. And I say sometimes in my homilies at the seminary, when especially if I'm dealing with some of this more legalistic approach or you know hard approach i say look why do you want to do that don't you know life is hard enough you're not there to make life harder for people you're there to help people get through life with their dignity and with the knowledge that god loves them uh, and that the church's doors are open to them and the church's arms are ready there to embrace them especially in the difficult moments 
Amen. <laughs> I could talk for another six hours. <laughs> We've gone way over our hour. Uh, I have asked so six minutes. So. <laughs> I have so many questions. Um, I'll have to have you back at some point. Have, have you written any books? I have written some yeah, books. I've written more articles than books. Yeah. Well, I, I would love to have you back at some point in time. Oh, that's great. I'd be happy to do that. We can we can follow up. Uh, maybe what to discuss. Uh, my uh, my dissertation might be of interest because I wrote on, um, it's really on epistemology, but it was applying the, the philosophy, the hermeneutical principles of Bernard Lonergan to the interpretation of law. Because that really goes <laughs> I, to the heart. It's kind of a deep topic but it has a lot to do with everything we've been discussing. So please feel free to follow up uh, in any way okay. that you like. If you have questions about anything I've said, let me know and I'll clarify anything more I can so do. Many on questions. It's been delightful. I want to know more about your background in music. I have questions about that, so I would love to have you back. Great. Well, it's um, been delightful for me too, Kiki. What a pleasure to make a new you. friend. Well, we're going to get you off to celebrate Mass. How about you end us with a prayer? Okay, well, let's just uh, do what we should do every day and give glory to the Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God, God bless. You. Thank you so Take much, care. Father. Okay. Bye -bye.